The Shaping of Gondor Part 1 The Birth of Gondor Chapter 2 Isildur and Anarion The world that the Numenorean exiles were venturing into in 3319 of the Second Age was a vast, unforgiving place indeed. Let us pause to take a brief look at the setting in which the remainder of our story will take place, at this Middle Earth as it was towards the end of the Second Age of the Sun. For the sake of expediency, I shall dwell only, on, only momentarily on regions far removed from the focus of this tome, while those more directly involved will be described in greater detail. Suppose we begin with the Numenorean colonies and move clockwise around the lands of the continent. The coast stretched from north to south for 3,000 leagues, the deep and boundless sea of Belagir lapping dolorously against its shores. The uppermost part of the mainland protruded outward in a large bulge, and then gradually receded the further south it progressed, it then tapered into a toe-shaped peninsula before curving into a vast arc forming the Bay of Belfalas. It was on this bay that many of the earliest Numenorean colonies were established, in the young centuries of the Second Age. Five major rivers crisscrossed the territory before emptying into the bay, the Harnan, the Lefnui, the Ringlo, the Cerni, and the Anduin. The last of these, the Anduin, was the longest and deepest river in Middle-earth, coursing for 1,600 miles down the length of the continent and ending in a wide delta which poured into the bay. It was on this river, about 50 miles above the delta, a tributary called the Erui joined the main flood. The Pel Pelargir, one of the first colonies of Numenor, was founded in about 2000. It swiftly grew into a bustling town with a sizable population, perhaps 50,000 by 3319. Trade and shipping were the main business of the Pelargiri, ones in which they excelled and brought in much profit to Numenor. 600 miles to the south of Pelargir, broad inlet with a small, narrow mouth pierced the coast of the bay. It was a perfect natural harbor, and about five centuries before Pelargir, her sister colony, the haven of Umbar, was established there. Although she too conducted trade with the native peoples, her biggest commodity, as time went on, became that of people themselves. Almost from her inception, Umbar was known as the largest and most lucrative slave market to be found in Middle-earth. She did a tidy business in the capturing and enslavement of men. But though, Pel but though Pelargir and Umbar were the most important of the Numenorean enclaves, they were far from alone. Towns, villages, ports, and settlements had sprung up all along the rim of the Bay of Belfalas, spreading their tendrils of civilization deep into the interior. Farms were cultivated, fields and pastures cleared, rivers dammed and roads constructed. North of the bay, were the White Mountains, a chain of lofty, perpetually snow-capped peaks. They ran for 500 miles from east to west, encircling the lands on the northern edge of the bay like a great natural fence. Beyond these stretched an immense expanse of territory known as Eriador. Eriador was a region of rolling hills, flat plains, dense forests, and brawling streams, which was only thinly inhabited by men at the end of the Second Age. Three large rivers coursed across it, the Angrim, the Guathlo, and the Baranduin. West of Eriador stood the chain of the Blue Mountains, which were cloven by the shimmering Gulf of Loon. Occupying the territory behind the mountains and on either side of the Gulf was Linden, the greatest of all the elven realms in Middle-earth. There, Gilgalad ruled over a quarter of a million elves, men, and dwarves. Their chief city and haven was the port of Mithlond, also called Greyhaven because of the grey cliffs and crags which surrounded it. North of Lindon was the Bay of Forachel, a frigid, ice-choked body of water which formed the extreme northern limit of the continent. Moving west through Eriador, we then encounter first Imladris, the sequestered valley stronghold of Elrond Half-Elven, then the Misty Mountains, the longest, highest, and most majestic of all mountain ranges housing many orcish and dwarven civilizations, including the legendary Khazadun. The chain cleaved the land down the middle like a gigantic spine. 
Immediately west of the Misty Mountains flowed the Anduin River, along whose middle course sat the elven forest kingdom of Loranand, under the Sindarin king Amdir, and west of that grew Greenwood the Great, the largest woodland realm in the world. Here, the elven king Orifer held supremacy over the multitudinous forest folk. South and east of this sat vast Rovanion, a swath of virtually uninterrupted swain and plain and grassland, sprawling over an area twice as large as that of Greenwood. Rovanion was home to a variety of hardy, semi-nomadic nomadic tribesmen who dressed in clothes made from the hides of deer and horses, which, which roamed plentifully over the terrain. South of Rovanion were the volcanic Ash Mountains, a forbidding chain which curved around in a wide, jagged semicircle a thousand miles long. Within this natural fortress lay Mordor, the abode of Sauron, and for much of the Second Age the most terrible and powerful realm in Middle-earth. Home to something close to a million men, orcs, and other fell creatures, the Blackland was not only the largest, but also the most populous populous of all the dominions of, in the land not bound to Numenor. Beyond Mordor's southern border lay still another large, flat, open territory, that of Harad, or Haradwaith. Probably no other land on the continent was more barbaric and uncivilized. Home to a population in 3319 of about half a million, its inhabitants observed many unsavory customs. Among them were the practices of having their womenfolk in common, fleeing pleasant prisoners and undesirables into spike-filled pits, turning their enemy skulls into drinking cups and even cannibalism. It truly was a godless and heathen place. Although many different tribes competed and fought for this or that patch of Haradrim soil, the land was hardly ever unified, something all to the good for her neighbors, and was usually dominated by Mordor. At Harad's north, southern, and eastern edges, the landscape gradually bled into uncharted and inerable desert, forming Middle-earth's southern boundary. West of Harad, we come back to the Bay of Belfalas and the colonies of Numenor. Such was the world, in brief, that a tattered group of refugees were about to plant their flags and build their future realms. With that in mind, let us now pick up the story where we last left off, with Isildur and Anarion separated from their father and driven helplessly toward Middle-earth's southern shores. Five remaining ships of the Numenorean fleet supposedly made landfall first, not on the mainland, but on the island named Tolfalas, which sat 30 miles from the, from the mouth of the Anduin. After making some minor repairs and holding a reverent ceremony to the Valar and thanks for their safe passage, they then continued on their way up the Anduin and put in at Pelargir. There, the castaways disembarked and Isildur addressed the citizens in a stirring public ceremony pronouncement. The exact words of that speech are not known, but the substance of what was said has come down to us clear enough. Numenor, Isildur said, was gone forever. The colonies could look to her no more for guidance and protection. They were henceforth on their own, and would have to take care of themselves somehow. Hence, For the purpose, they would need leadership and the two brothers offered themselves to fill this position as the sole remaining survivors of the Numenorean nobility. It was an offer which was most agreeable to the Pelargiri. Without Numenor and her, native pa and her naval power, the colonies now lay naked and vulnerable before the savage and brutal inhabitants of the interior. Some central authority was clearly necessary, or else the colonies were sure to dissolve into quarreling confederations and go down piecemeal to the barbarians. Besides, Isildur and Anarion were right. They were the senior surviving members of the, Num of the no Numenorean royal house, a position which carried great prestige and honor in colonial eyes. To be sure, their, follow El their father Elendil had also weathered the fall of Numenor and found safety ashore in the north, but the lands to the south did not yet know about that. In addition, the past exploits of the two in the service of the faithful in Numenor were well known ashore, lending them an aura of gallantry, and heroism. There was really no alternative, and so Pelargir in Urimei of 3319 agreed to acknowledge the joint rule of Isildur and Anarion as lords in the mother country's stead. It might have stopped at that, but word got out and swiftly spread throughout the other lands surrounding the bay 
that Pelargir had found for herself two paladins from the cream of the Numenorean aristocracy to lead and defend her. Moving with alacrity, the remaining colonies, with the exception of Umbar, sent envoys to Pelargir to ask that the same protection and leadership be extended to themselves. In return, they too were prepared to recognize the brothers as masters. In reaction to this clamor, the two quickly realized that a new world of possibilities was opening before them, and accordingly began thinking in much grander terms. Why settle for being more mere provincial lords when far more impressive titles were to be had? If it was possible to bind all the colonies together under themselves, well then, why not? Then they would be kings, and their names would have that much more luster in the histories, as well as in the minds of their subjects. In any case, was it not their just right? A new kingdom, then. That was what the brothers intended to have, and they made as much clear to the envoys gathered at Pelargir in the summer of 3320. If the other lands settled by Numenor wished to become part of a new realm built in her image, then it would have to be all or nothing. Isildur and Anarion would be kings absolute and unchallenged in their authority, or else they would go their own way and leave the other colonies to fend for themselves as best they may. The colonial representatives were somewhat taken aback at this sweeping proposition, and not being able to acquiesce on their own, had to wait several months for approval from the various councils, assemblies, and governors of their homelands. By autumn, that approval in some cases reluctantly given, had arrived, and things could move forward. And so it was that on the 10th of Hisame of the year 3320 of the Second Age, in an impressive ceremony outside the gates of Pelargir, each envoy of the erstwhile colonies knelt down and presented the sons of Elendil with an oaken branch, a traditional symbol of fealty among Numenor's people. Having done so, they stood and spoke in unison the pledge which has rung down through the ages. We, having come here to this place to do obeisance, giveth homage before thee now, as our captains, our protectors, our lords, our kings, our swords, shields, and bounties and lives are hereafter thine to call upon whenever thou wilt, for one kingdom and one people we are now forever unified against the forces of darkness. Now, until the stars fall to the earth and the waters, let us stand together under thee as a pillar of stone to do battle with whatever power should oppress us. For no longer are we divided. We are one under the light of the sun and the stars of the Valar. It was a historic moment, for this so-called obeisance of Pelargir is considered to mark the creation of a new kingdom, the Kingdom of Gondor, and the tenth of Hisame was quickly set aside as a day of special observance amongst her peoples. As things turned out, it proved to be well worth the commemoration, for the time was to come when the young realm would rise up out of her humble beginnings to become the mightiest power in Middle-earth, and in her arts, achievements, and grandeur, the unquestioned heir of Numenor. A landmark had been reached, and the world would never again be the same. Isildur and Anarion were each about a hundred years of age at the time of the obeisance of Pelargir, and despite being quite different in both temperament and character, they made a good team. Isildur, the elder sibling, was a warrior through and through, muscular and over seven feet in height, with darkling gray eyes, he was exceptional in appearance even for a Numenorian, and almost from the beginning took the lead in the soldierly matters in the kingdom. Anarion was smaller and fairer, and though a fine captain himself, tended to be drawn more toward the administrative side of government, governments, and was content to defer to his brother where the armies were concerned. In this division of labors, the diarchy ruled the Stoneland masterfully for a century following their accession. To the north, meanwhile, Elendil and his fleet landed in London, and within a year or two of the obeisance had founded the kingdom of Arnor, with his seat in Anuminus on the shores of Lake Ninual. Communications were quickly established between the sister realms, and Isildur and Anarion hastened to swear fealty to their father as high king of the Adain. It should be recorded that at no time did Elendil ever try to exert any actual authority in Gondor. The two realms were too far apart in distance, and the proud provincial lordlings to the south would surely never have tolerated it. The oath of fealty amounted to little more than a military alliance, 
and a small yearly indemnity to any Minas. In the first few decades of the rule, the brothers held court in Pelargir. The largest and most populous city in the realm, it only made sense to make it the seat of government, and this did much to add to the legitimacy of the Diarchy's rule. This was fortunate, for the brothers' tasks were many in these early years. Provincial borders, as well as the exact boundaries of the realm, needed to be defined, for instance. In 3325, to that end, a noted Pelargiri cartographer named Halas was commissioned to survey the royal domain and set the matter to rest. After a year or two of careful consideration and negotiation with the various lords, the dominion was forthwith divided into seven provinces, Anphalas, Lambdon, Belphalas, Lebanon, Lasarnak, Anorion, and Athelion, from east to west. Because Gondor's bounds were never to contract beyond these lands in the 26 centuries of her existence, they came to be known as the Seven Heartlands of Gondor, and by that name I will refer to them from here onwards. The external borders were also neatly settled around this time, largely because no powerful neighbors existed near enough to Gondor to dispute them. By the terms of the Charter of Halas, Gondor was now quite a sizable realm which stretched from the White Mountains to the Bay of Belphalas and from the Lefnui River to the Mountains of Shadow, a distance of some 500 leagues. Almost of necessity, certain administrative complications needed to be sorted out as well. The obeisance of Pelargir had created a kingdom out of a loose confederation of colonies, but no device whereby to defend, finance, or order it conveniently. The brother kings, most particularly Anarion, were determined to remedy that by constructing a more efficient and streamlined government. Of the many difficulties, one of the many difficulties was the kingdom's chaotic justice system. Each province observed a different code of laws, with penalties which differed sometimes wildly. Certain lords adjudicated their own suits, while others deferred to local magistrates. Jurisdictions overlapped in a confused tangle. To put an end to this muddle, Around the same time that Halas was charting the Dominion's borders, a gifted lawmaster from Kalembel named Inzelbon was tasked with drafting a set of laws and penalties that would be held in common throughout the land. For three years he labored on it, and when he was done, the crown saw to it that it was accepted by the lords of the realm. And by 3329, one set of laws, the Code of Inzelbon, so named after its author, was supreme in Gondor. This law code was to remain largely unchanged for twelve centuries thereafter. As time went on, it became evident that keeping the royal court in Pelargir was not workable in the long term. The placing of the capital there lent the city a certain eminence that pleased the Pelargiri, but angered the other great cities and provinces, for it smacked of favoritism on the part of the diarchy and hampered them in their attempts to organize the realm. Some other arrangement would clearly have to be made. Fortunately, an alternative was, was at hand. About 150 leagues upriver from Pelargir, the Anduin passed through a narrow neck of land between the White Mountains and the Afal Duath. The region was quite fertile and largely empty of inhabitants, making it a fine royal base of operations. Around 3350, therefore, a location was accordingly chosen, according to legend by Divine Portland. The story goes that the two kings knelt in prayer on the riverbank, whereupon Manwe, Lord of the Airs, sent a, n a number of majestic seabirds to guide the two to the, side of the, new the site of the new capital. This site turned out to be a plot of land astride two sides of the great river, almost exactly midway in the valley of Pelennor. With the will of the Valar made clear, therefore, the foundation stones were swiftly laying, and the fledgling city was christened Osgiliath, meaning the citadel of the stars, in the elven tongue. With the royal patronage, Osgiliath quickly grew. In three years, it contained a population of 10,000, and, and in another three years, Isildur and Anarion felt confident enough to relocate the royal mint there. Shortly after the founding of Osgiliath, the brothers founded two additional strongholds on either side of the valley. At the base of Mount Mindeluin, Anarion founded Minas Anor, the Tower of the Setting Sun. On the opposite side, in the Vale of Morgul, Isildur established Minas Ithil, the Tower of the Rising Moon. It was in the city there that Isildur planted the sapling of Nimloth, which had be it spirited away from to Middle-earth at the time of Numenor's destruction, 
and it remained there three quarters of a century. Both, both Minas Anor and Minas Ethil were intended as little more than military forts at first, bastions of defense for the main future capital of Osciliath. In time, though, their stature would grow immensely. As the brothers labored, the realm's administrative structure slowly came into focus. In 3364, the Lord of Lossernot, the smallest of the seven heartlands, died without heirs, whereupon the province reverted to the crown. Rather than assume direct control over Lassernach, however, the brothers delegated a viceroy, known as a demavir, meaning lesser lord, to administer it on behalf of the diarchy. Over time, the lords of the remaining five heartlands would come to be known as krondirs, meaning crowned lords. In addition, the garrisons of Minas Anor and Minas Ithil were combined into a special company, tasked with the defense of the still unfinished capital and its surrounding hinterlands in Ithilian and Anorian. Because these soldiers bore the sigil of the royal house, two entwining white trees, they became known as the White Guard, and the, two pro and the two provinces they safeguarded came to be called the Royal Ward, since they were administered and policed directly by the crown. By 3370, Osgiliath was judged to be sufficiently populated and secure, and in the spring of that year, Isildur and Anarion formally declared it as capital and seat of government, and set up their twin thrones in the king's house there, with Inzelfon as their, at their side as chamberlain. Fifty years after the abasance of Pilardir, the kingdom of Gondor, under the diarchy, was thus well on its way to becoming the strongest and most efficaciously ruled land in Middle-earth. These were bountiful years indeed for the young realm. The greater consistency of laws across the provinces encouraged and increased trade, which in turn led to greater wealth in the towns and cities, and a small but appreciable boom in population. It is thought that just about a million people resided in the Seven Heartlands at this time. This boom extended even to the royal family. Isildur's wife, Queen Telpirion, bore him two additional children around this time, while Anarion's queen, Aridel, provided him with three sons, thus securing the strength and longevity of the royal line. Diplomatically, too, the diarchy made advances. On the western border of Belfala sat the port, sat the port of Ethelond. It had been founded around the same time as Numenor's colonies in the south by elvish mariners from Linden a millennium before, but had since, uh, had since then absorbed a fair Manish population from the surrounding regions. Following the obeisance of Pelargir, it had retained a certain degree of independence, but still acknowledged the authority of the court in Osgiliath, to which it paid an annual indemnity. Linden, it should be noted, denied the propriety of this, but the latter was largely ignored at first in favor of more pressing concerns at the time. In 3371, however, to shore up relations between the two kingdoms, the diarchy agreed to officially cede Ethelon to Gilgalad's rulership on the condition that the indemnity was continued, since, after all, it was partially Gondor ships that protected the sea routes on which the port's prosperities depended. This was agreed to, and went a long way in furthering the friendship between the two kingdoms, a friendship that would prove most valuable in the future, as we shall soon see. With Arnor, too, trade and travel flourished greatly during these years, benefiting both dominions. In 3380, to safeguard and aid the flow of this commerce and movements across the fords on, of the Angren River, the construction of a great fortress known as Angrenost was proposed and begun at the base of the mountain Methadras, with the sister realms each sharing the burden of labor and expense. It was largely completed by about 3410. Although at times to be of only limited effectiveness in its intended purpose, this edifice, with its imposing tower of Orthanc, still stands as a startling testament to the ingenuity and strength of both of the young realms, even at this early time in their existences. Only in a few instances did Isildur and Anarion make mistakes. In 3388, for instance, the Isle of Ker Andros, located in the midst of, the, of a divide in the Anduin River just north of Osgiliath, was incepted as the center of the faith of the Valar in Gondor beautiful hallow of white stone and marble was constructed there. To oversee the observance of the rituals of the realm, a certain cleric named Gelimir was appointed as Ainatar, or high priest, by the crown, an office he executed with much pomp and pageantry. The post would remain in Gelimir's family for nearly nine centuries thereafter. 
At the time, this royal patronage of the temple, as the Valarian cult centered around Ker Andros eventually came to be known, worked to the good, as it did much to strengthen the unity of the Seven Heartlands and the common worship of the Valar. In later centuries, however, the power of the temple would prove a hindrance to the effective governing of the realm and help to place Gondor at a needless disadvantage. To be fair, though, all this happened under circumstances that Isildur and Anarion could not possibly have foreseen. A much more serious error was the Diarchy's underestimation of the threat to the East. For all their labors in the realm over the period of half a century, surprisingly little attention was given to Mordor or her probation. A small garrison was stationed in the Vale of Morgul, and a sporadic Gondorian presence was maintained at the gates of Mordor. But aside from these half-hearted measures, no attempt was made to monitor or patrol the Black Land. Just why the royal brothers took such a, a careless attitude towards this matter is unclear. Most likely, it was a mixture of conceit and miserliness. Soldiers and garrisons were expensive, after all, and Sauron had been absent since the destruction of Numenor. It was a gamble that was to cost not only Gondor, but all of Middle-earth dearly. For, after half a century's respite, the Dark Lord 